quick. In progress. All right. So <clears throat> as I was saying, the Southwest Communities Chamber, we've, we've changed gears a little bit here over the past two years, heading more of an advocacy and support level. And we have had the great, um, the great ability to have some events over this year, but as what we were just saying, COVID has kind of picked up a little bit and we hope everybody's safe and we wanna make sure we keep everybody else safe. So we've switched over to this webinar. So thank you to everybody who's attending today. I know you were all expecting to have a wonderful breakfast um, and hopefully you still did at home. You just didn't get it in person, but we thank you for coming in here. Typically we've done uh, an economic forecast through the chamber over the years, but this year, because of everything in the environment with COVID, uh, we wanted to make sure we touched on the workforce because I think that's a problem for everybody across the board, whether you're a big company, a small company, there's issues uh, getting employees, having employee retention, and everybody's talking about the great resignation. So I think it's very important for us to see some different ways that different industries are coping with the changes in the environment out there and how uh, the industries are managing and get some good tips, hopefully, as well as look at the economy and how it's been affected as well. So today I brought in Bill Flanagan from Allegheny Conference, Audrey Russo from Pittsburgh Technology Council, and Larry Pantuzo and Barb McCullough from Washington Health System to kind of go over everything that's going on in their industries and give some light to, you know, the trickle down effect maybe that that's affecting our businesses locally as well as across the region. So I'm gonna start with Bill. Um, thank you, Bill, once again for coming today. And let's make sure that the screen share is working as I know you've brought, I believe a slideshow. Bill is a pro at all of this, so I'm not too worried he'll walk me through it. And uh, just a reminder to have everybody mute yourself if you are in this uh, webinar, just so we give Bill the floor and make sure that he doesn't get interrupted. We will be able to ask some questions at the end. So please jot down any notes that you have and any questions you might have and you are more than welcome to answer them or ask them at the end. Uh, please use the chat box at the bottom to ask. Uh, we, if you don't want to wait for the end, we can, we can put it on the roster for me to ask. All right, Bill. So please, um, Let's get our screen share up and uh, get started. Thank you so much for being a part of this. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you so much for uh, for having me participate in this today. Thanks for everybody for tuning in. Sorry we can't be there in person. We are all uh, still working through this this pandemic thing. And I guess the, the bright way to look at it is we've all learned a lot of new skills. <laughs> and that's going to all help us going forward in a variety of ways through our careers. I've said to a lot of businesses, if you've made it this far, you are going to be so much better on down the road uh, as a result of everything we've experienced. So what I thought I would talk a little bit about today is kind of a quick snapshot of uh, from the perspective of the Allegheny Conference in terms of kind of where we are in, in some of the big takeaways from the regional economy, but more important, some of the big uh, trends uh, that we're seeing in terms of employment and, and labor force in the region um, and kind of what's uh, some of the concerns. I mean, this is a Chamber of Commerce group and I think it's helpful for all of us to understand what some of the challenges are because those become the, the basis of the actions we need to take at a policy level uh, and uh, in a workforce development level and all the other things to really be able to move the region forward. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of an overview along uh, those lines this morning. Fortunately, I'm gonna try, oh, let's see, uh, my screen share is disabled right now. So Amanda, you're gonna have to enable my screen share. <clears throat> Still disabled. Sorry, let me unmute in case you got to walk me through this. All right, screen share. Yeah, you should have a permission button on your screen as the host that would allow you to uh, grant screen share privileges. All right, I'm on the screen share. Has anybody else done this recently? Unfortunately, I can't see that screen because I'm not I'm not the host. <clears throat> I can't see those controls. 
Um, so it says share screen at the bottom. Yep. One participant can share at a time. Multiple participants can share simultaneously. I have there, that. Now it's working. Okay, whatever I you did, did, you solved it. Okay, cool. Excellent. <laughs> All right. All right. Hopefully everybody can see this screen now. Um, and I am going to just fill the screen like that. Come on, there we go. Okay, so yeah, a little bit on kind of where we are. You know, the Allegheny Conference at the end of 19, just before the pandemic, uh, came out with a whole new regional brand called Next Is Now and a 10 year vision for the future of the region. So we're chipping away at it uh, three years at a time. And that's kind of where we are. You know, before the pandemic, uh, the, the region really had some significant challenges, uh, which uh, comes as a surprise to a lot of folks who live here in Pittsburgh who thought uh, we were all doing pretty well uh, just pre pandemic and certainly relative to a generation ago, we're doing spectacularly. But the reality is, if you looked at our region, even before the pandemic, in terms of our economic performance, we were slower, the economy was uh, growing more slowly here, the GDP, uh, than the nation as a whole, than competing regions, we were still struggling with issues around employment and population and aging workforce, lack of diversity. We've talked about those issues for, for decades here in the region. Uh, disparity in performance, depending on whether you're white and black, you know, a minority or not in the region. And uh, deteriorating infrastructure, which was becoming more and more of an issue uh, before the pandemic. And then uh, our old Achilles heel, just uh, uh, the economic climate here in Pennsylvania with some of the highest corporate net income taxes in the country. Uh, and just a, not a real pro-growth, pro-business, pro-dynamic kind of attitude here. And we found ourselves, even at the end of the last decade, beginning to lose ground to the regions we compete with. Uh, and, and I'm not just talking Austin and Denver. I'm talking places like Cincinnati and Baltimore. So a lot of issues that were already uh, beginning to challenge the region before the pandemic. And then, of course, along came COVID. And, uh, and that's exacerbated some of these trends that were already in place. The good news is we've been moving forward. We, we've been recovering from the worst of the pandemic almost two years ago. Uh, as of October of this year, uh, the, the Pittsburgh Regional Alliance, one of our affiliate organizations, tracks what we call WINS. These are business investments or expansions in the region. Our target for the year was 40. As of October, we were up to 32. So a little bit behind most of that as a result of a lag because of the pandemic. Businesses are just slower to make investment decisions. And that's been the case for the past year, but still moving forward and we're seeing investment in the region. We're seeing a lot of interest in the region. Our pipeline of projects, uh, companies that are kicking the tires, trying to decide if they're gonna come or not, uh, it's now up to 149. So that's on the high end of our historic uh, pipeline of potential projects for the region. And that's, that's really encouraging. A lot of them are kind of in the more tech space, uh, the innovation space, a lot of them in warehousing, some in manufacturing, you might expect all of that. Um, not so much in, in office space and those types of commercial real estate projects, which you also might expect given all the uncertainty about the, the, the world we live in, in terms of our, our virtual world. And we've actually begun to make some real progress, we think we hope, on, on tax reform in Pennsylvania and business climate issues. The legislature seems to be receptive to trying to make some real progress this year, so we're encouraged. Big win last year with a federal infrastructure bill. We expect that will bring hundreds of millions of dollars into the region over the next several years. So we're encouraged by that, continuing to work with businesses across the region to get everybody organized to go after the investment and make sure that it lands here in our region. Huge initiative, the end of last year and currently underway around this Build Back Better grant from uh, the federal government that could put tens of millions of dollars in the region to grow our autonomous systems cluster. Think self-driving cars and uh, automated warehouses, stuff like that. We think it's a huge opportunity for the entire region and lots of partners are all pitching in to see if we can land that federal investment. So that's a, that's a really big deal potentially. And then we're continuing to run our programs at the conference to invest in community redevelopment, especially the places that have been left behind. So there's some good news and we're making some progress and that's all very encouraging. Um, as of November, and the employment data lag up by a month, so you might have heard the federal data came out last week, and the numbers were looking pretty good at a federal level, where our regional numbers lag by a month. So looking at the November data, employment across the metro is about 94.5% of where it was pre-pandemic. So we have yet to recover completely all the, all the employment that was lost as a result of the pandemic. So we're still coming back, but we've come a long way back when you consider just how challenging it was a, a year ago. 
The downside is after some significant improvement in the spring, it's kind of leveled off and we're not seeing a lot of employment growth over the last half of last year. So that's something we're really keeping an eye on in the region. Um, and I should mention this, the, all these data are coming from the Pennsylvania Economy League, which is one of our sister organizations. I get to work with a lot of really bright people who crunch the numbers and uh, you know, can provide this kind of analysis and perspective. So I'm always grateful for that. Looking at where we are in terms of the unemployment rate in November, it was looking pretty good for uh, a little under 5% here in the metro. Uh, that's uh, outperforming Pennsylvania and outperforming the nation as a whole. And in fact, it's the smallest uh, gap between the national and regional unemployment rate that we've seen in the region since June. So that's uh, been encouraging on the unemployment rate side, and, and it's been improving steadily since, since the summertime. So all that is very good, but, there's, but there is a but to go with that. The improvement we've seen in the unemployment rate is not only the result of job creation, and there has been some companies are adding some jobs. The more concerning trend for our region is people leaving the labor force. And those are people who are either working or available to work, looking for work. And, and the labor force in southwestern Pennsylvania has actually been declining. That gets back to what Mandy mentioned, the great, the great resignation. Here in our region, there's also a great retirement underway with the baby boomers hanging it up. And then another uh, one of our members called it the great reassessment, just everybody taking a look uh, at where they are in their lives and their careers as a result of the pandemic and just saying, hey, I want to find something else to do with the rest of my life or my career. So there's a lot of dynamics unfolding right now. It's not just a Pittsburgh uh, challenge. It's everywhere in the country this is unfolding. But we absolutely are see seeing it here in our region. Um, what we found is that the number of unemployed uh, individuals in the region has been going down, which is great, but at the same time, the labor force uh, has been falling for the third straight month in November, so fewer people available to work. So it's not that the number of unemployed people are, are declining because they're all getting jobs. Some of them are just giving up, right? They're, they're moving away or they're choosing to do other things with their lives. So that's a concern. If you're an employer and you're struggling to find people, this begins to explain it may not just be you, it may be these broader dynamics uh, that are playing out in the region. The most concerning number to me was that the labor force in Southwestern Pennsylvania is now at its lowest since July of 1990, 30 years ago. Think about that. That was coming out of the steel bust. So that's the kind of setback we've experienced. All the gains we've made over the past generation in terms of building our labor force in the region have been eroded uh, by the, the uh, ripple effects of the pandemic. So that, that continues to be a concern as we look to the future, because we need a growing labor force to be able to attract industry and investment. The, the industries that are most affected by all of this right now, and again, this is looking at the November data, construction, administrative and waste services, agriculture, forestry, fishing and hunting, arts, entertainment and recreation after a strong uh, rebound earlier in the year has started to flag a little bit. And then transportation and warehousing, interestingly enough, in terms of being able to attract the people they need. Construction's seasonal. So I, I've been told by our experts, we shouldn't pay a whole as much attention to that as being pandemic related but it certainly is part of the seasonal dynamics that are at play in the region. So those are the, uh, the, the industries that are being most stressed. But this idea of not being able to find people is really playing out, um, you know, playing out across the economy in southwestern Pennsylvania. So you might wonder why, you know, where is everybody? You, we, we, it was such a crisis. If you think back to the spring of 2020, you know, why isn't everybody working? Why are they all desperate to come back to work after they all got displaced? So we decided, you know, rather than just speculating, we would literally ask them. We would ask the people that are affected by all of this. And fortunately, we've been working with Schmidt Market Research since virtually the beginning of the pandemic doing regular consumer confidence surveys for our TV show, Our Region's Business, and for the Pennsylvania Economy League. So we've been able to take the pulse of the region, that's literally what we call it, the pulse of the region survey. We've been able to take the pulse of the region uh, several, well, originally it was every couple of weeks, lately it's been once a month, uh, kind of from the beginning of the pandemic. So last May, so this is a you know, while ago now, we asked people why they were changing jobs. What was leading people as the economy began to recover coming out of the pandemic, why were they choosing to go work someplace else? 
far and away, you know, uh, better pay and benefits were driving people to look for other places to work, better or flexible hours. Already we were seeing this idea of workplace flexib flexibility really manifest itself. Half the people said that was a factor. Some said a better industry, almost half said that. Some said a better commute. And in some cases, that's because people kind of got used to working from home, maybe not having to drive. Uh, you know, a, a half hour or more or take the bus to get to work. So they were looking for those options. Flexible work location, important to about a third of them. And about 22% concerned about COVID safety. So they wanted to find an employer or a working environment uh, that would give them more peace and uh, peace of mind about their health. So that, that was the snapshot last spring when we asked why people were leaving the, uh, the companies they already worked for. Um, then we, all, we asked later uh, in June, a month later, we asked uh, for those who were not looking for a job. So it, the, the previous slide was for people who went and got a new job. These are for people who were not uh, looking for a job. Why aren't they looking for a job? And um, uh, half of them were because they're already retired, so they don't need that. We think that retiring number has gone up. Uh, because of the percentage of baby boomers in our workforce. We have a, a higher percentage of baby boomers in our workforce than competing regions. And some of them are choosing to retire uh, earlier or just because of the pandemic, they've decided to hang it up. So that's a factor. Uh, when you get beyond the retirees, about 26%, a quarter of the people said they couldn't work because they had to stay at home uh, to manage the house or the kids. That gets the childcare issue. Some just wanted to take some time off. They were in a position to do it. Uh, some were assessing their current situation, trying to make the right move. Some were dealing with kids' education. They had to stay home for kids' remote learning. Uh, what was interesting was only 8% of the people who were not looking for work cited those sweetened federal uh, unemployment benefits as the primary factor. So it was a factor, but based on the surveys we did over the course of the last year, it did not seem to be the big driver of why people were choosing not to work. Um, and then finally, in November, uh, coincidentally to align with the employment data I already shared, uh, already shared we, we asked the non-retirees uh, across the region why they, why they are not working. And uh, the vast majority of the people who are not working and not looking for work cited parenting, childcare, and family support for their inability to get back in the workforce. So that means for every employer, thinking hard about childcare issues, that could be a major barrier keeping employees from coming to work for you or coming back to work for you. About well, 13% said it was mental health, self-care, time off. 9% uh, were on disability. So as you'd expect, there's some people who can't work. 3% were in school uh, and, and were not working. What was interesting that by November, pretty much nobody said it was because of sweetened unemployment benefits. That was had ceased to be a factor in terms of people. Uh, not coming back to work. So that's kind of the big picture. That's what we're finding as we talk to people in the region. Uh, and obviously this all affects individual industries in different ways. And fortunately, we've got a couple of different industries uh, here to talk about that. Mandy, I'll turn it back to you. Thank, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you so much, Bill. Uh, the only question that came up and we can ask more at the end of the session is, do you think the great resignation is correlated to people leaving the region? Some of it is correlated to people reaching, leaving the region. I don't know if you saw some of the data last week on Pennsylvania, just in general. So it's not just our region, but Pennsylvania in general, uh, sort of an exodus, especially of uh, those, those mid-career uh, mid workers who have a lot of options and can go look for other places to work. So part of that's a factor. I think some of this, you know, we did a study called an inflection point back in 2015. It was a forward projection of our labor force in the region. And one thing we discovered at the time was there were almost 300,000 baby boomers uh, in the workforce who would be eligible, eligible to retire over the next 10 years. So by 2025, that was 22% of the region's private sector workforce in, in 2015. So now you roll that clock forward, we're seven years into the loss of 300,000 baby boomers from the workforce without lots of people moving into the region to replace them. And then we think on top of that, the pandemic because of the great retirement has accelerated that trend. So we may be in worse shape in terms of that retirement trend uh, in 2022 than we expected that we would be when we did the study back in 2015. Thank you. Uh, if there's any other questions for Bill, we'll definitely ask them at the end of the session. You can put them in the chat box and I will be happy to help or ask, or you can ask yourself. 
Now, another industry that we have that has been almost a savior for us is the technology industry. So I wanted to bring in Audrey Russo of the Pittsburgh Technology Council to talk a little bit about what's going on there and uh, once, you know, thank them for all that they've done to kind of get us all moving. Uh, I want to say post COVID, but we're not post COVID yet, but, um, you know, keeping us up to date and keeping the businesses in our area going. So Audrey, please share with us what's going on in the technological industry. Unmute. Okay. Good morning, everyone. So thanks. First of all, round of applause for Bill for setting the stage. Um, I totally, there, what I'm going to do is I'm going to drill into some of his points and I apologize. I, it seems like I'm getting a cold. Hopefully that's all it is. So, um, but I think Bill set the stage in a very realistic manner. And uh, I really appreciate the work that the conference and the Economy League and the PRA have done over this period of time to put some pieces of reality that strip out some of the spin. Um, some Because we've had a lot of amazing things that have happened during that period of time. But there's a piece in there that I think all of us need to remember, and I'm glad Bill brought it up. It's that 1990, these numbers, our numbers right now, people who were on the ground actually working is really, is really low, is really low. Despite the fact that what I'm gonna talk about right now is very promising, right? But as a result of what I'm talking about, I also want to, again, sort of point out that there's a big bifurcation in our community and it is not just age because many of the people who are nearing um, or are boomers, whatever category you want to want to call people, they are staying in tech jobs, right? They're not necessarily exiting them because of many of the things that have happened during COVID, flexibility, demand for their skill sets, you know, rooted in the community, not willing to necessarily pack up and go and start somewhere else. Uh, commitment to companies, right? Commitment to the innovation. So we are seeing that. So it could be that the boomer effect inside what is right now about 27% of our workforce. So think of everything that Bill just talked about, almost a third. And I don't want to, I don't want to lift it. It's really 27%. Okay, over the last 10 years, that's lifted about a 10%. So if you take the data that Bill's been talking about, the pop, the, the work, um, the number of people who are employed shrunk, but 10% more are working in tech jobs and tech related fields. Okay, so the pie is shrinking, but more people are working there. And then we also do have a point, Bill, that our population, our age population has um, decreased, meaning that we're, we're average age right now is about 42. About 10 years ago, it was 47, okay? So that may not seem like remarkable, but it is something that the researchers, and I have talked to some of your researchers about it, and it's really unfortunately the aging of our population who are no longer with us. So people are living longer, right? But we're still at 42. So if you think about that um, population of being the average age of 42, there's another slice inside of this tech economy is that people who are working in tech in particular have the highest educational attainment levels. So back in the 70s, it, the while we had more people who were actually in the workforce in the 70s who were actually working, their educational attainment level and working in, in jobs that were life-changing jobs, meaning you know, they could raise a family of four, they could raise a family of five, their educational attainment level was often not even high school. We were considered a place where you didn't have to have even a high school degree and have a job that chain that that allows you to be lifted out of poverty. So we've shifted over these years, right? You look 40 years, we've shifted. We're highly educated in many of the, in what I'm talking about right here and in those jobs. So 27% of those jobs. The other interesting piece is that 
of those 27% jobs, 35% of the, the jobs are the highest wage earners. So you can see the disparity, right? People who are working in tech and working in technology jobs are the highest paid. And that includes people who are foreign born. We hardly have people who are foreign born here. In 10 years ago, we had less than 2% that were foreign born. Today, we have about four to 5%. And if you look at the city of Pittsburgh, which is a really, really powerful statement that, taught that, that leverages what, what um, Bill has talked about, is the city of Pittsburgh lost 10,000 African-American people, 10,000 over this last census. Okay, so the city is slightly shrinking. We lose that many. And yet our Asian Americans who are living in the city of Pittsburgh have, in, have increased for the first time. Small population of immigrants, a big bifurcation in terms of people of color and having access to the work of innovation and technology. So the jobs in innovation and technology have grown. The wealth of the people who are working in innovation technology have grown. The people who are, um, who are the obviously the most educated, you know, academically educated. I don't like that term because I think you can be very well educated in other pathways. But people who have gone and matriculated through the university system is high. And simultaneously, we have more, we have a high demand for these high skill jobs. The companies that have grown in Pittsburgh are, are predominantly, even though last year we had an, an incredible, incredible positive hiccup of those companies that had independent um, public offerings, IPOs, that was the first time since I've lived here that we've had that. And that was in, two, I moved here in 2001 and we had four, which means that wealth creation and opportunity should have a trickle down effect into, into our economy. But again, the, the growth of companies that are in Pittsburgh are basically research-based and, and uh, strategically partnered with our universities. They are close to the universities because they want the talent there. Information technology, information technology jobs, and that means not all tech, those are jobs where they're, they're data centers, managed services, where you outsource services to, you know, that you don't want to keep those, those services inside your company, the old help desk, the old customer support. And I say the old, I'm allowed to say that because I grew up in that. That's where my career emanated, coming out of the back room and, pro and, and providing support and application support. Those jobs have decreased. Those jobs have decreased all across the United States, not just here in Pittsburgh, but we are finally seeing the ripple effect of what it means to outsource information technology, whether that's onshore in our backyard or whether that's offshore. So those jobs at one point were really growing our economy, really growing the economy here in Pittsburgh. And now finally, why? Because you don't need as many people in data centers anymore. It used, it, it well, once was a time you'd have 30 people in a data center. Today, you can go into a data center and there's two people because everything has been automated. Every, so the, op, the effect of automation is affecting us in information technology. The good news is that we are seeing investment, investment that is coming out from outside of the region. And that's capital investment, which is called venture capital, or private equity, also known as PE. And it's coming into the region and trying to stay close to the universities and close to the people who are building companies. University, our universities, particularly Carnegie Mellon and the University of Pitt and the work in the life sciences that come from both of those universities paired with the UPMC and their investment in the, in the life sciences ecosystem have attracted people here to come around and look for those kinds of investments. The not so good news is that we're leaving people behind and we, you know, and I can talk later about what we're doing at the Tech Council that I'm absolutely jazzed about that person by person we're really working through, but 
really level setting this conversation is really important to know. We have an incredible ecosystem. That ecosystem is small. Even though that ecosystem is, represents a third of the wages, it is out of reach for many people. And we have demand for jobs that is extraordinary. So now we are seeing more and more companies, both tiny, tiny meaning if Bill and I started our own company in our own garage, or to companies that have 100 people or more, which is nice size tech companies, by the way, nice size when they're at that scale. We would say to ourselves, Bill and I would say to ourselves, if we can't find the talent here, where can we find that talent? And do they need to be right here in our backyard? No, I'll tell you. So I wanted to just, you know, I, Bill, I could hug you because you set the stage so perfectly and so pragmatically. And it's not dismal, but I think it's really important for people here to understand what some of these opportunities are and how complex the issues really are, because it's not just a Pittsburgh ecosystem. It's a global ecosystem and nationally we compete. We compete because of our, our corporate um, sales tax. We compete because of the fact that we have an aging workforce. We, you know, we compete. It's not to say that there aren't people that are moving in to Pittsburgh, but it's really not creating you know, an N1. You know, there's not that positive that's happening as a result of that. You can see the proliferation in neighborhoods, like even in, even in the North Hills, you can see the growth. You can see the growth in the city, obviously, when it comes to Lawrenceville and East Liberty and the Strip District and the building there. But that is a small piece, even though we visually see it, it's a small piece of, of who we are. And I'm proud to be a part of the work that I'm in right now, but I'm also worried and actively involved in creating pathways so that other people can be a part of this world. So I hopefully that gives you a little bit. And I have, I have a whole bunch of data. I didn't prepare for slides like fancy Bill Flanagan did, but I am, you know, I have all the data and I'm happy to talk about it. Oh, those slides, they were great. Audrey, you did a fantastic job. Again, if anybody has questions, uh, we can ask at the end. Uh, maybe sometimes you have to take it in a little bit before you, you think of what questions you might have. Um, thank you. And, and hopefully we can figure out how to turn things around with the aging population. That seems to be across the board an issue. And hopefully these young kids who are technology driven are gonna stay in the area and hopefully build up our economy again. Let's uh, switch it over to the Washington health system, obviously another industry that has been uh, changed in so many different ways. Let's see what they're doing to, to bring in recruits and to keep them, retain them. And uh, we're going to start with Barb McCullough of Washington Health System. So Barb, I give you the floor as well, and we'll bring Larry Pantuzo on after. Thank you, Mandy. Good morning, everyone. I'm Barb McCullough, I'm the VP of HR for Washington Health System. And just to give you a little background about Washington Health System, a lot of people just think of our primary hospital here in Washington County, but we have uh, 2000 employees across three counties. We are actually a two hospital system. We have 40 off-campus facilities that include 18 uh, primary and specialty care physician practices. And we are also deeply ingrained in chemical dependency and recovery uh, programs. We have had, as all healthcare facilities have had, significant impact to the workforce during this period of COVID. Um, prior to COVID, I would share with you my private little two tunnel rule meaning if we had an employee here, they weren't gonna leave us if they had to drive through one or two tunnels for a job. So it was always my strategy to ensure that in our recruiting area, we kept the two tunnel rule in mind and it, it had been very successful for us through the years. We are also a teaching institution. We have a physician residency program. We have our own school of nursing. 
we have our own radiology program that we have joint ventured with Cal U. Uh, we do a lot with other nursing schools. And we also, through the um, decline in workforce through COVID, we've developed two non-certified programs to try to fill the void that we have for phlebotomy and for medical assistance in our physician practices. Typically, these are professions that, attack, that attract young individuals who are entering healthcare for the first time and who may or may not have education beyond high school. And they have been positions that have been a challenge for us to recruit and fill. Um, we created internal programs where we paid individuals uh, the, an hourly rate in order to participate in the education and then residency that we provided. And in return, they would guarantee us two years of service. You know, we've also done creative things with our School of Nursing because by and large, our School of Nursing graduates stay here, which is really nice. Uh, we do typically lose some to uh, specialty um, hospitals once they graduate here. Children's comes to mind as an organization that we will typically lose one or two graduates to uh, for people who want to pursue that, that career in pediatrics. At the beginning of COVID, my recruiters were focused on filling about 50 positions of which about 30, 33 of them were registered nurses. And if you fast forward to where we sit right now, the number of nursing vacancies has doubled. So I have about 70 nursing vacancies and the number of overall vacancies has quadrupled. So we went from 50 to 200 and they are widespread positions, um, everything from clerical all the way up to leadership positions. And it takes a lot of different positions to run a hospital and all the services we provide. And I would say the vacancies are pretty well scattered around the, the organization. Um, we find that enrollment is down in some of the programs. The physician residency matches were a little more difficult this year. Uh, the enrollment into the School of Nursing is down. Um, we continue to do things to try to retain individuals. So that's the complexion of where we are from a recruiting standpoint. Uh, it's pretty bleak, actually, uh, when you look at the number of applicants who apply in our applicant tracking system, um, it does not compare at all to where we were prior to COVID. So you might wonder, what are we doing to try to retain individuals? Uh, we are in an environment right now where nurses are going to go to the highest bidder. So it's all about cash. And nurses are leaving the organization, despite my two tunnel rule, um, to take on positions that are called travelers. And Larry can tell you, Larry has been in the nursing field for a long time. Um, in what I would call the old days, a traveling nurse is one that basically was unattached from a family standpoint, and they were willing to travel throughout the country and make a ton of money doing it. And after a few years as a traveler, um, an individual would usually come back to home and either apply or reapply at one of our regional organizations. The word traveler has taken on an entire new definition during COVID. We are losing nurses to Cannonsburg and that's called a traveling nurse. And they are going down the street and they are making double and triple the hourly rate that they would make as a non-traveling nurse. So it's not hard to understand how nurses are giving up long careers at Washington Health System, despite the, path, the fact that we have historically paid very competitively because there are, there are higher bidders out there. Uh, we have done just a litany of things during COVID to support our workforce, not just our nurses. A few things are a little unique. Uh, our police chief has a retired canine named Izzy. And Izzy comes to work every couple of weeks 
and spends time in critical care with our nurses and on other floors where our nurses have been very traumatically impacted by caring for COVID patients during a time when we didn't allow visitors. So our employees were the ones that were with COVID patients as they suffered and in some cases as they passed away. Izzy has been a great positive impact on the workforce. It is amazing what spending a little bit of time with a dog can do for one's morale. We have also used uh, some of our expertise at the Wellness Center and we've offered chair massages on the different units. So our individuals who are uh, massage therapists will take their chair and go around to different units and give employees the opportunity to step away for 10 or 15 minutes to, to help reduce stress. You know, it's an ongoing battle and I can't tell you that we have all the answers because we certainly don't, but the competitiveness in healthcare for nursing and other positions has really just shed a different light on what we are going to have to look like and what we are going to have to do to recruit to the future in order to remain staffed adequately to continue to provide the services that we've provided in the past. So at this point, I will ask Larry to chime in. Larry is our VP of Business Strategy and Clinical Services and a nurse by education and training, right, Larry? I am, I am, thank you, and, and good morning, everybody. And, and as Barb said, it's it's been quite a challenge the last uh, 18 months of, I don't think that there's anything in any of our training or our experiences that have prepared us for, for what we faced um, over the last 18 months. And a lot of it, I think, um, if we look back historically, we've seen coming, um, but we thought it was gonna be 2025, 2026. And when I say that, when you look at the, the data that Bill presented with the aging workforce, nursing is not um, immune to that. You know, we too have an aging workforce um, in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, it's about 50.1 years old is the average um, age of a nurse. Um, and, and nursing itself has really gone through metamorphosis over the last 35 years or so. You know, traditionally, nursing positions were at the bedside or in a doctor's office. Over the last 30, 35 years, we've now seen nurses working for insurance companies, uh, working from home, doing utilization review, doing chart audits. We've certainly had a large expansion of nurse practitioners. Um, some of us may go to the emergency departments or into our doctor's offices. You see a nurse practitioner, um, as well as nurse anesthetists um, working in the operating room, helping uh, people with surgeries. So nursing itself has really changed. And um, certainly we saw a, a, a exodus of people um, as the pandemic is really, um, ground on more and more people who have been teetering, whether they're going to retire or look for another job, it's kind of really pushed them into um, accelerating their search for other things. So when you look at Pennsylvania, we're, we are number three out of the top five states in the country for nursing shortage. Um, so we follow behind California, New York, Pennsylvania sits at number three, four is Florida and five is Texas. Um, and a lot of that is an aging workforce, as well as just an aging population. So as the baby boomers age, they consume the healthcare needs. Um, so that, that all factors into it. And then, you know, we can't downplay the role that, that uh, certainly COVID-19 has had on hospitals everywhere. Um, whether it's the increased length of stay, you know, typically in acute care hospital, about a three and a half to five day length of stay has been what we saw historically um, but when you factor in the COVID patients, many of them long haulers, it's not uncommon to have 10 or 14 days um, in patient stays with those people, which again, um, you know, it takes a grind on, on the nursing staff, constantly donning and doffing personal protective equipment, et cetera. Um, and then just dealing with COVID amongst our own staff, um, whether they're vaccinated or not, you know, we, we are nothing but a, a, a microcosm of the community. So as, as COVID goes through the community, so too it does it through our workforce as well. Um, and, and as Barb said, the traveling piece has really been something. We've, we've done a lot of things um, to try to combat that and to keep travelers. We, we knock on wood have not had to have travel agency nurses here at Washington. 
Um, but we've done some really creative things to um, make it enticing for staff to pick up extra extra shifts here. But if you're familiar with healthcare at all, you know that we're the only industry in the world that doesn't get paid what they charge. Um, so the you know the federal government and the insurance companies tell the healthcare industries what we're gonna you know it's nice that we want to charge hundred dollars for something. And we appreciate you doing that, but we're going to pay you fifty dollars or seventy-five dollars for that, and and you know we take it and we move on. So it's uh, it's really presented a challenge, and I think it's going to continue to to create a strain on on the healthcare industry going forward, particularly along the um, the lines of the smaller independent hospitals, of which there's really only a handful here in Western Pennsylvania. The other one of the big impacts for nursing itself has been, if you look back a hundred years in history almost every hospital had a nursing program. Um, the diploma programs in 1970, there were 1300 nursing diploma programs, which was a two year program typically. Um, and you would sit for the, the NCLEX, which is the nursing um, certification licensure exam, and you would become a registered nurse in Pennsylvania. Now in 1998, there were 100 diploma schools um, left in, in the United States. So. It's really taken a toll. We still have one. There's a handful still here in Pennsylvania, not many. Um, but, you know, when you look at a two-year program versus a four-year program, um, four years, as we all know, from between the ages of a traditional college student from 18 to 22, four years is a long time to change your mind and, and do other things. You know, if uh, I can work in an industry that's 24 hours, seven days a week, and I can work holidays, weekends, and evenings, and, and in all kinds of weather where I could, you know, go with my uh, sorority sister and my fraternity brother who's doing IT and I can work from home and make a lot of money doing that, that might be a little enticing and, and cause people to change their minds. So I mean, the healthcare is definitely a calling. Um, I don't think anybody does it uh, uh, for the for the pot of gold every other Friday on payday. Um, it's it's a calling and it's and it's difficult work, which, which presents challenges for us, um, certainly going forward. But um, you know, it's not uh, something that certainly is is uh, a Washington issue. It is uh, every one of our colleagues, um, not only regionally but nationally as well, um, are facing this this same crunch. Um, and the you know the, the resultant um, symptoms of it are you know you read about it every day. The the longer wait times to get in to see your primary care providers, the longer wait times in the emergency departments, um, the delays in getting. Um, surgeries done that I, I don't call them electives because I don't think most acute care hospitals do anything that's elective. Everything's approved by the insurance company, but maybe non-urgent. Um, you know, the hip replacements, the, the joint replacements, the maybe the, the non-acute, um, non-emergent spinal surgeries, things along those lines now are taking, you know, several weeks to get to get scheduled, whereas 18 months ago, 24 months ago, you could probably go see your doctor today and be on the OR schedule in a few days or next week, certainly. Um, so it certainly has a trickle down effect. And, um, you know, it's going to it's going to take some time, I think, for us all to uh, to get out of this. And we're certainly going to come out of it as a different industry. I don't think any one of us are naive enough um, around the around the table that we sit around uh, Barbara, myself every Wednesday. We all know that the health has changed, um, at least for the foreseeable future, if not forever, because of this. Um, and exactly, you know, how, how are we going to adapt to those changes to ensure that we, we provide the services and have the workforce, I guess, is the million dollar question. Thank you, Barb, and thank you, Larry. Um, I think it's safe to say that across all these industries, things are changing and we don't exactly know what the future is, but we're all trying to get through it, figure out what to do next. And I'm hoping that you know, both in the tech field, um, as well as all other industries, including healthcare, that you guys start getting these recruits that you need and people start getting interested in the positions again. Um, obviously, with the competitive salaries out there, that makes it a little more difficult, but hopefully things will turn around and we'll figure it out one way or another. Um, does anybody have any questions for any of our speakers today while you have them? Um, we'd like to keep up with their industries and what they're doing throughout the year um, and be able to share it. So Larry and Barb, Audrey and Bill, please let us know if you have any updates, anything coming up in, that we should know about, even webinars um, that our audience today can, can keep up to date with it. Does yeah, anybody have, have any questions? 
Yeah, Mandy, if I just one, one thought, and I, I, I want to make sure Audrey gets to talk about this, because I think one of the challenges we have as a region is that bringing people in from the outside is going to be really, really hard because everybody else in the country is dealing with exactly the same dynamics. So our, you know, we've thought for the last 20 years, well, we'll just go and attract talent. That's gonna be our solution. And if we're gonna solve the kinds of problems we're talking about, we're gonna to have to dig deeper among ourselves and empower more people and enable more people who are already here to, to make a contribution. And I know the Tech Council is one great example of, of launching an initiative to really focus on that opportunity of squeezing more out of, out of those of us who are already here. And, you know, Audrey, I just think you should have a chance to talk a little bit about Apprenti Pittsburgh yeah. and what you're doing there. Oh, thank you. So, you know, in the middle, in the middle of um, COVID, at the beginning of COVID, that I, you know, we're going through the same thing that, you know, everyone was going through, but my board chair, Jason Wolf and I decided that we wanted to have listening sessions with CEOs and CEOs uh, could be of large companies, small companies, people who have a lot of tech. Remember our big multinationals, you know, a significant portion of their capabilities come from the innovation of tech. And they brought a lot of tech uh, skills inside their companies where 10 years ago, those used to be firms. Now they're actually requiring the same kinds of skills that you might typically see or need it at, at, you know, the NASDAQ companies like, you know, the Googles and the Facebooks and, you know, even the Microsofts, now they're in-house and they're facing a lot of these gaps and that exacerbated by, you know, the, the whole movement of Black Lives Matter with the murders of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd. And we said, you know, we really need to talk to people and listen. And we did this listening session that probably went on for like four to six months. And what became glaring, and many of you might say, how, you know, gee, Audrey, you're not that smart. What took you so long? But I can tell you what became glaring was that as a region, remember Pittsburgh, it's, you know, I'm an urbanist, so I love urban core and I understand the importance of an urban core. But as a region, we have many, many people who have been totally disconnected. And that even includes the city of Pittsburgh, right? That have not been part of these opportunities for prosperity. And there have been many attempts over the last decade of boot camps and you know, going to community colleges and giving people loans so that they can you know, try to, to have access to this work. But we decided, you know what, we're gonna debunk that. We're gonna just say, you know what, that, that if people go, when people go to school, and we all know this, right? Particularly if you have kids and you haven't, and they have had to subsidize their own college expenses that they're living with tremendous debt, tremendous debt. And that has been an impediment in terms of their own prosperity as they leave universities or colleges. So we, uh, found that the state of Washington was doing a very interesting program. And they essentially said that for years, the unions and, and through the Department of Trade and, and Labor and Commerce, they had certified apprenticeship programs. And we in our region are amazing for, for apprenticeship programs, particularly in the buildings and trades and steel uh, workers. You know, you can go down the line in terms of a lot of those capabilities. And they have apprenticeship programs. So the state of Washington, which is, they have a counterpart, small tech um, council there. And, you know, we know them. And they decided to go after the compliance and same format that the buildings and trades and the construction industry and the boiler makers, et cetera, have gone after and good, become certified apprenticeships. Now, why is this so important? It's important because there's a, there's a rigor and a regimen to what the curriculum is for those skills. And they put together 12 job categories. We're looking at 14 maybe, but 12 job categories that have been approved through the Department of Labor and then trickle down into the state of Washington through their approval process through the Department of respective Department of Labor's. And they create an apprenticeship program. Good old fashioned, I would say what we're doing, we've copied it essentially. We've said, you know what? We, I, at the Tech Council, have incredible relationships with business leaders, incredible. And 
everyone is talking about, oh, you know, we don't have enough diversity. Oh, we're not reaching the right people. Oh, we can't find talent. And we've said, no, we're going to we're going to flip that around. We're going to flip that around. So through the state of Pennsylvania, which is a very arduous process, by the way, because the state of Pennsylvania thinks tech isn't the tech ecosystem and the tech jobs aren't in need of the same kinds of requirements that, you know, building and construction and trades, et cetera, that, uh, you know, we shouldn't be essentially apprentices, right? Have an apprenticeship program, but they finally turned its head around thanks to the leadership in Harrisburg. And we really worked hard. We, we've certified two jobs and we, this certification process allows us to do a couple of things. One is it allows us to create a job. So let's say a junior software analyst or developer, junior software developer, and that software developer goes through an assessment. And this is an assessment that is uh, based on logic and math. And you don't have to be a, you have to, our only requirement is that you have a GED or you have a high school diploma. The, it is an assessment that we mentor, we coach people through. We allow them to take it three times. They have to achieve an 80%. And believe it or not, lots of people pass this assessment. We have, we have a very strong pipeline and we mentor and coach them. And then we work with companies who day one, when they go through the training bootcamp, which we have, um, we have criteria for what that curriculum is, and they go through the boot camp day one, they're hired. They have an interview process. Day one, Audrey gets to work for Bill Flanagan's company. And she is paid at least minimum wage, at least. She is given anything that she needs, whether it's a laptop, any kind of support, you name it. If there's issues on childcare and uh, she goes through the program and she has mentors, she has coaches. We work with the ecosystem of people who really wanna help. That are, that are really competent in their, in their roles and development. And at the end of that period, they get at least 60% of what that job is. So it's the same exact model. Uh, I, you know, so don't think I'm being clever. It's the same exact model as the building and trades. 60%, they go in, and they work in the company. They get benefits, they get be everything from the start. And then after about 2,000, 1,800 hours, they're then right at where that job was advertised for. So that could be, that, that usually is about uh, 75K to, to maybe 90K a year. And they're part of that company. And we are working really, really hard. We're just starting our second class and we're working with robot companies, you know, robotics, automation, some of the big companies. And, and it's still a heavy lift. It's still a heavy lift. There's a lot of, you know, education that needs to occur. We are getting people from the Mon Valley all across, peppered across the Mon Valley. Actually, COVID has helped us because they can do a lot of this remote. They can get coaching remote. It is full-time work. It, they are working in their uh, educational settings and in, in their boot camps that we've approved, they're working 40 to 50 hours a week and they're getting paid and they are part of the companies. So we are planning to scale this. And the reason why we got it certified through the federal government and through the state is because they're eligible for some of these subsidies that allow them to get paid. So we have to work with the companies to make sure that the integration really occurs, that people feel that the, you know, any of the obstacles are eradicated. It's, it's a heavy lift, but I, this to me, this is some of the best work that I've been involved in because it is changing lives and it is giving people access. And when I say people who are disconnected, they're people who are living in the Hill District or living in, you know, Larimer or they're living in Manesson. You know, we have enough people who are peppered through the Mon Valley that could, if you just looked at the pure numbers of people who could work. So our criteria is a person of color, a veteran, a woman, or a person with a disability. And that's our criteria. And so I think our first class was 70% African-American. 
So we, and we have a pipeline of about 200 people. What I, what I need are more companies, more com We have the inverse of what they have in Washington. In Washington state, they have more companies and less people. We have more people who meet the criteria and less companies who know how to um, really partner and do this work. Because what happens is when you're in companies, you think I'm, I just need the skill set now. Well, that's an old fashioned mindset. We're not going to change if we say that I need that skill set exactly today. We have to create this kind of pipeline of work. So I'm thrilled about it. It's a Prenti. You can go to my site, 40 by 80, 40x80.org, or you can just reach out to me. I'm happy to talk about it. I have incredible people who are doing this. I have incredible partners. And I think it is some of the most important work because we have people who have been disconnected and they are in our backyards. It's all across Southwestern Pennsylvania. Thank you, Bill, for laying me up for that. Yes, Audrey, that's, that sounds like a great program to get people into new jobs. And so if there's any companies out there who are listening right now and you have any interest, exactly. please contact Audrey. And um, does anybody else have any questions for our speakers today? I know some people are shy out there, so. Well, if there are questions after this session for any of our speakers, you are welcome to email me at mandy at southwestcommunitieschamber.org. And I will be happy to pass them along and get answers over to you. As I have recorded this, this will also go online, hopefully within the next couple of days so you can watch again. I know there was a request bill for the slideshow, so I didn't know if they'd be available afterwards, but, um, you can let you me know. know. I, yeah, but Manny, I'll send you a PDF. I think this is all stuff that we've released publicly. So I there, there shouldn't be an issue getting you a PDF of the deck. Okay. So I'll, I'll and if there is, question. just let me know. So um, lastly, we want to continue this conversation after the session. And everybody here is invited. We have our new Business Connections Roundtable that will be taking place on January 20th at 9 a.m. And it's just a place for open discussion about the topic that we have discussed today. So if you'd like to come, we have it. We had it for members only, but because of the special circumstances of COVID, it's opening up some more space. So if you'd like to join, we'll be putting the link out tomorrow in regards to um, signing up and having an open discussion about what we can do and how we can help in this climate and help with everybody in your industries, no matter whether you're a small or large company. Thank you once again to Bill Flanagan, Allegheny Conference, Audrey Russo of the Pittsburgh Technology Council, Larry Pantuso and Barb McCullough of Washington Health System for giving us their time today. And thank you all for attending. Uh, you get out a little bit earlier since it is on a webinar. So congratulations and go enjoy your day. Thanks everyone. And thank you. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you. Be safe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.